Of all the infuriating strategies to exist in competitive Pokemon, few are as effective at inducing a feeling of helplessness as the dreaded Baton Pass. And it doesn't seem like a particularly menacing move at first, so you can pass boost to something else. Is that a big deal? As we'll explore in this video, the answer isn't just yes, but a yes redolent with years of anguish from fighting this blood boiler of a tactic, as well as the protracted policy battles it took to get the strategy removed in the first place. After decades of dominance, the player base has had enough, and that is why Baton Pass is the strategy that will stay banned in singles. And one of the most powerful strategies in singles is going to need one of the biggest mobile games ever to help produce this video because this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. In fact, Raid is so flexible that you can play it literally anywhere. Here are our top three places to play Raid. For us, it's in the kitchen while making food sitting outside trying to get some sun and while we're editing this video because I can literally just do this while I level up my champions and this month raids just released a giant new feature awakening and a brutal new dungeon the iron twins fortress if you're good enough to take down the iron twins you'll see a huge payoff being able to awaken your champions awakening your champions lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle but wait here's the big news raid has just released a super powered legendary version of everybody's favorite champion death knight the whole raid community has been waiting for this for a long time, and the best part is everyone can get him for free just by logging in. All you have to do is log in and play raid for 7 days between now and October 27th, and you'll add Ultimate Death Knight to your collection easy. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free champions to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50. 5 star ascension. The promo code is available for both new and existing players. And if you haven't started playing raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion Tyrell, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, and 1 XP boost and 1 ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. But Tom Pass wasn't always the automatic ban it is nowadays. In GSC, it was, for a long time, looked back upon as a positively mild introduction for such a malignant move compared to what it would become, a tame origin for a strategy that grew more oppressive and dangerous over time. There was many reasons BP was at its least effective in its debut generation. Several key features of GSC naturally made its life difficult, such as phasing moves being everywhere to deal with Snorlax, and there being no abilities nor taunt with which such phasing moves could be blocked. Locked. One couldn't even pack their own phasing move to get the first phase off. Thanks to GSC mechanics, if two Pokemon attempted to phase each other at the same time, the faster one will fail. Furthermore, GSC's maxed out stats across the board, as opposed to the split EV system of later generations, meant that even if a pass was pulled off successfully, there were still many Pokemon that could take a hit. However, even in this neutered guise relative to more modern generations, Baton Pass was still a terrifying, potentially overwhelming threat that nobody dared take lightly in the rare event they faced it, lest they suffer a brutal, humiliating loss. And it's precisely this humiliation factor that leads us to, before we go any further, explain the virulent hatred of BP that's been around for decades. The fundamentals behind its cross-generation bans. Sure, anything can potentially embarrass you in a battle, from a seemingly unbreakable stall team to a devastating setup sweeper. However, those strategies aren't considered quote-unquote cheap by anyone good, because with a good team and good play, you can reasonably handle them. The reason good players have abhorred BP for so long is because when you face BP, it doesn't matter how good you are. BP removes skill from the equation. In many cases, the choices on both sides are very clear and obvious. When facing BP, either your team can handle it or it can't. This is antithetical to how Pokemon is generally played. Sure, your team might be weak to something like Tyranitar, but you can play around it. There is very little quote-unquote playing around a BP team since if the match 
matchup is advantageous, the BPT doesn't care what you do. The difference between this and being weak to Tyranitar is night and day. Furthermore, BP isn't used by anyone who is looking to outplay their opponent. Because again, BP means it doesn't matter how good you are. Even if your opponent is worse than you, but they have the tools to handle BP, then there's not much you're going to do about it. This brings us to why BP is considered cheap. It's a largely all or nothing strategy that aims to remove skill from the game and prays that the opponent doesn't have the tools to handle it. And well, why wouldn't you have the tools to handle it, you might wonder. This has been a furious source of debate for almost as long as BP has existed. Indeed, in GSC, it is quite simple to be well equipped for BP teams without going out of your way to handle them. See the aforementioned plethora of phasing moves you're already going to be packing. However, in later generations, there are far, far more threats to cover, and doing so is already difficult enough. Certain types of teams will naturally destroy BP, yes, but other types of teams aren't going to be able to handle them without severely compromising themselves against the rest of the metagame. Of course, the move baton pass isn't inherently quote-unquote cheap in the same way that other clause moves such as double team or sheer cold are. There are some so-called honest forms of baton pass out there. Cheap baton pass involves Pokemon who are fully, entirely dedicated to passing boosts to others in attempts to win entire games on the spot. They aren't good standalone pokes. Multiple passers often exacerbate this. Quote unquote honest BP comes in the form of good Pokemon who can BP, but number one, remain good Pokemon on their own, and number two, don't pass game ending boosts. In GSC context, this most notably includes Growth Pass Vaporeon, who can also pass substitutes most notably. More rarely, Jolteon can pull off a similar strategy. The most prominent form of cheap GSC BP came in the form of Pokemon like Smeargle, Jolteon, and Scizor passing speed, and Scizor potentially passing attack to monstrous physical sweepers. The go-to was Marowak, who, thanks to Thick Club, hit the Generation 2 cap of 999 attack after a single Source Dance and was the greatest one-hit KO machine in GSC, including in Ubers. Other monstrous physical threats include Snorlax, often with Belladrum, and Meditate Machamp. This serves as a microcosm of what makes BP so much more ridiculous than it may seem at first. Huge threats like these were often palatable by virtue of their flaws, in this case their low speed. BP stat passing fixed that and made them overbearing. Well what about stopping the pass with phasing or attacking moves? Surely nobody would just allow these stat boosted monsters to come in for free? Well, it's a nice idea, but if it were that simple, this video wouldn't exist. Again, it was much easier to naturally do this in GSC, but still far from guaranteed. Certain teams matched up much better than others, and thus these teams could be quite devastating still, which is why they were occasionally used. One method they used to ensure a successful pass was Smeargle's Spore. Another was using a passer that threatened phasers. This is why Jolteon was so commonly used. Since Skarmory or Suicune would never try to phase it, it hit Tyranitar hard as well. And with Hidden Power Water, Jolteon threatened other common phasers like Steelix, Rhydon, and Golem. Roar Raikou would phase it, but Jolteon could easily paralyze it with Thunder, and from there, Raikou could be in trouble. And that was the unique threat of GSC BP. You couldn't just stop the pass once like in later gens, it threatened over and over. There was some element of strategy to even cheap BP in GSC, which is what made it more bearable. In addition to a prolonged Jolteon assault, some teams also relied on Drumlax exploding Skarmory to enable Scizor's passing. However, the strategy was still considered cheap because it was incredibly fish heavy in the matchup department. Plus, the same maxed out bulk that let many Pokemon take hits even from BP boosted threats went both ways. The BP boosted threats packed that same bulk and it wasn't always enough to live the hit if you weren't KOing them back afterwards. For example, in advance, full health Marowak wouldn't avoid a two hit KO from Zapdos's hidden power, but in GSC, it did so every time. Regardless, agility pass was certainly palatable, which is why no tearing action was taken against it. However, there was another form of cheap BP in GSC, and this was considered problematic from a tearing standpoint. Trap Pass. Trapping an opponent with Umbreon's Mean Look or Smeargle's Spiderweb before Baton passing out was as potentially game-ending as it got. It could let Snorlax effortlessly accrue six curses and win on the spot. Umbreon had some use in this role on so-called regular teams, since it could still function as an effective piece of their defensive core, but it also fit on the cheap BP teams as well, since it was potentially the best enabler they could have. It could also cheese phasing attempts with Confuse Ray. You could throw Skarmory into it, and with bad confusion luck, Umbreon would pass to an electric type, which would collect the free KO and leave Umbreon free for its trap pass later. What made this even worse was that you didn't know what Umbreon was running when it came in. And unlike most other 
other Pokemon whose sets you couldn't immediately reasonably guess, especially with the lack of team preview, this guesswork had too high of a chance to instantly end the game, which is generally a good sign of something being uncompetitive. Smeargle and its endless move pull, even with the sleep trap ban that prevented it from running Spore and Spiderweb on the same set, was similarly unpredictable and dangerous. This is what recently led the GSC player base to deem that strategy uncompetitive. Since there was no reasonable way to know what sets the Pokemon ran, and their reward for doing so was disproportionately high, especially for something that didn't require skill, just matchup. As such, even GSC, which for the longest time was the only gen with no BP bans, has finally joined literally every other gen in having the move at least neutered in some form, as Mean Look and Spiderweb can no longer be used in conjunction with Baton Pass. But time pass became more multifaceted and thus more threatening in advance. Whereas GSC BP generally still had some sort of play element to it, this was the generation where BP really established itself as the skill destroying, game dominating terror that would characterize it in every subsequent generation as well. With higher base power moves, more boosting options, and the lack of maxed out bulk EVs across the board, the Pokemon being passed to were more threatening. Sure, they didn't have maxed out bulk themselves, but with new boosting options like Combine bolstering their defenses, they didn't need it as much. Furthermore, it was easier to set up extended BP chains now. Number one, phasing moves were not as mandatory or popular as they had been before, and number two, tactics like Ingrain could stifle Roar and Whirlwind, while Soundproof blocked Roar and Parasong. Indeed, the addition of abilities was critical for BP. It wasn't just Soundproof either. Ninjas's speed boost meant it could grab those all-important speed boosts without needing to use agility and to risk getting hit. It could simply substitute at protect repeatedly. With another huge addition, Pinch Berries, Ninjas can even sub down to get an attack boost in conjunction with multiple speed boosts without ever risking getting hit. Finally, BP was bolstered by the wider distribution of the move. The aforementioned Ninjas was certainly a notable one, but the most significant additions were Celebi and Zapdos. Celebi had descended to OU from its previous place in Ubers, whereas Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness had bestowed the move upon Zapdos. We'll focus first on the cases of so-called quote unquote honest BP in advance, which most prominently featured these Pokemon. The first instance of honest BP came in the form of so-called dry passing, which meant using baton pass without any boost or even a substitute. Literally just using baton pass in the same way you would use U-turn. This was most commonly seen on Zapdos and Jotian, as they were the most directly offensively dangerous of the bunch, thanks to their combination of great speed and ferocious stab thunderbolt. Thus, they were most able to exploit the defensive switches they forced by scouting them. Another underrated application of this technique was that one couldn't double switch against them. For instance, if one had Zapdos against Tyranitar and the Zapdos didn't have Baton Pass, then the Tyranitar user, knowing Zapdos would switch out, could switch itself to get a leg up on the Tyranitar answer coming in. However, you couldn't do this against Zapdos packing Baton Pass, because if you switch, the Zapdos user would know before choosing their next Pokemon, and could thus act accordingly. Jolteon also had another benefit for Baton pass, as it allowed it to escape Dugtrio's arena trap in early game scenarios where Dugtrio was at full health and thus out of KO range for Jolteon's hidden power. Of course, though Zapdos and Jolteon were the most common dry passers, Celebi also used it to great effect, and so did the occasional offensive Vaporeon, one of its biggest advantages over fellow offensive water types. In a similar vein, all these same pokes could sub pass effectively, potentially choosing partners which could maintain the sub on a switch in, and thus making them infinitely more threatening. Celebi Celebi and Vaporeon's 101 HP substitutes meant that substitutes wouldn't break in the face of Blissey's Seismic Toss, which was incredible to safely get a partner like Tyranitar or Dugtrio in against it safely, while Zapdos and Jolteon used their and their teammates' typing to play off Rhesus, such as safely passing to a Metagross against a Snorlax or Regice switch, something Vaporeon excelled at as well. The other common, honest form of passing was Celebi's stat passing with either Calm Mind or Swords Dance, both of which it excelled at. SD Pass was a a bit more specific since it was only really usable on Magneton physical offense teams, but the potential rewards were huge. Little was more devastating than sending plus two attack to agility Metagross. Meanwhile, Combine Pass had all sorts of applications, as in addition to the increased offensive threat of its recipients, the greater resilience in the face of special attacks was much appreciated as well. For instance, a Combine Pass Tyranitar was able to devour Hydro Pumps that were otherwise doused and strike back with threatened special moves. Combine Pass Celebi could and did 
did pair with Baton Pass Zapdos. Not only was passing Calm Minds to Zapdos absolutely terrifying in and of itself, as Zapdos sometimes accentuated this by running agility, making itself even more dangerous, while also being able to pass speed to teammates, which had benefits like making teammates such as Metagross no longer vulnerable to Duxtrio. Celebi and Zapdos were often able to keep many chains going, passing both boosts and creating super-powered teammates. However, even something like a Calm Mind and Agility Pass Pokemon like Jirachi wasn't exactly broken. Sometimes offensive Baton Pass Vaporeon even joined in the fun, providing a ferocious offensive threat that was an excellent recipient of both Agility and Baton Pass, while potentially even adding 101 HP substitutes to the mix, and still being a great standalone Pokemon at that. The aforementioned SD passing Celebi brings to mind another Pokemon for the role, Ninjas. Now, though it had its rare moments, SD Pass Ninjas was generally a gimmick, since it brought absolutely nothing to a team defensively. Sure, it could act as a surprise punisher of Choice Band Earthquake's late game, especially if it ran Hidden Power Bug or Fighting to smack Tyranitar with its Source Dance and Light Chi boost, but even then, it wasn't particularly reliable. A lot had to go its way. However, Ninjas brings to mind the style of BP that truly cemented the move's status as cheap, and at times nightmarishly impossible to deal with. The Full Chain, which refers to a team of six Baton Pass users, five of them committing to a boost repeatedly and passing the boost between each other until they can pass to Zapdos and Metacham, who in their super boosted state will easily win the game. Zapdos and Metacham also pack Baton Boost themselves, so they can easily pass back to one of their teammates to accrue more boost if needed. We cover this in lengthy detail in our Ninjas video, but in summary, Full Chains require speed boost. This allows them to get up substitute, boost their defenses, and and BP to a counter regardless of what the opponent has on the field. For example, if the opponent has a Heracross out against Vaporeon, boost defense. If the opponent switches to Zapdos, Baton Pass to Calm Mind Celebi. Rinse and repeat as the opponent flails helplessly, eventually not even being able to win with a crit since it will just thud against a substitute. In order to safely sub boost and pass in front of whatever your opponent brings in, you had to be faster, and it was incredibly easy to supply all the speed boosts in the world with Ninjas. What about anti-BP methods? Well, those helped, but certainly weren't guaranteed. Ingrain Smeargle anchored full chains, literally, and blocked Roar and Whirlwind's phasing effect. Ingrain's healing also allowed for the creation of more substitutes. Mr. Mime's soundproof also blocked Roar, which, most notably, forced Skarmory to run Whirlwind, which meant it couldn't run Drill Peck thanks to the two egg moves incompatibility. And thus, it had to rely on the inferior hidden power flying if it wanted to safely phase Mime. Soundproof came with the additional benefit of completely stuffing Celebi's parents. Song. Even something like Taunt didn't help much, thanks to the move's one turn duration in advance. Full chains were established as the ultimate cheap shot in advance. They were on the rarer side initially, as when advance was the current generation, the battling community was smaller, and there was a greater emphasis on skill and even honor. If you used BP, you were basically admitting you couldn't win by playing better, and needed to rely on facing an opponent whose team couldn't handle Baton Pass, which wasn't exactly quote-unquote honorable, especially with how limited the options to stop BP. BP were. Now this didn't stop BP from being used at all, but the players who chose to run it were few and far between, so the strategy didn't exactly take over the metagame, at first anyway. And full chains weren't the only kinds of cheap baton pass in advance either. Belly Drum Select Berry Pass Smeargle was a different kind of extreme. Thanks to Spore, you weren't necessarily safe even if you had a phaser. Plus, even if you had two, then Smeargle would simply pass to Cradilly, whose suction cups blocked all phasing. Yeah, that's right, Drum Pass Smeargle allowed Cradilly to sweep entire OU teams. Refer to our Cradilly video for more information. More commonly though, Smeargle passed the Choice Band Metagross whose Meteor Mash destroyed everything in the game. The final form of cheap BP in advance was Trap Pass. Umbreon returned and its newfound access to Taunt made it incredibly dangerous. If it successfully got the Trap Pass off, that was likely game over then and there. It passed the Taunt Dragon Dance Tyranitar or Calm Mind Suicune or Cursed Snorlax who would each boost to a plus 6 and that be that. However, Umbreon was incredibly difficult to fit on teams, so it was rare, but it killed Stall. Those teams feared nothing more. As a result of the advanced metagame and community's increase in player base and modernized influence from newer generations, which included a decreased emphasis on honor, BP began seeing more usage in tournaments and thus received tiering action many, many times over the years. Players wanted to preserve BP in some form as the honor strategies were integral parts of the metagame and thus they tried to limit it, axing its problematic elements. However, even in limited guises, BP repeatedly proved problematic. The 
first ban was Ingrain on Smeargle, since BP teams without it were generally seen as far more flawed. But BP teams' continuous use proved that it wasn't just about whether the BP team could stop the phase or not. The fact that teams without a phasing move were at such a complete risk of helplessly being annihilated was unreasonable. Next, a leaf was taken out of the old school German player bases book. They had been amongst the best players when Advance was the current gen, and recognizing BP teams' potential to ruin the game, played with a limit of two BP users per team. This set the precedent for this next ban, which limited BP to three users per team. That wasn't enough either. Eventually, Smeargo was banned from using Baton Pass entirely. However, despite all these limitations, Baton Pass continued to prove itself a toxic present. Eventually, a new complex ban was enacted. The three Baton Pass limit was lifted, as was the ban on Smeargo using Baton Pass. Instead, only one Pokemon per team could pass stats, and it couldn't pass more than one stat boosting method. For example, a team could have six Baton Pass users, but only one of those Baton Pass users could pass any sort of stats. Let's say Combine Celebi, since that's one move. The Combine Celebi can't even hold a Pinch Berry either. That would be a different form of stat passing, and thus not allowed. However, even this wasn't enough. For the effortless stifling of Roar, Mr. Mime and then the Soundproof ability were banned, which still effectively meant Mr. Mime became an Uber in Generation 3. What an insane thought, but it's true. It joined the ranks of Cacturn and even Cacnea in that regard. So in conclusion, after years and years of reeking destruction, Baton Pass has finally been removed of all its toxic elements. It has taken with it several unfortunate pieces of collateral. Most notably, teams that use both Agility Baton Pass Zapdos and Combine Baton Pass Celebi. But the player base generally agrees that this was a necessary evil. Gen 3 was, in all likelihood, the most chaotic generation as far as Baton Pass goes, simply because the player base wanted to preserve its positive elements. But it kept proving itself broken even after being limited a million times. Baton Pass also featured two obscene effect in Generation 3 Ubers. Phasing moves weren't that common, and even those few that did were stifled by Smeargle's ingrain. The negative effect that Smeargle, Ninjas, Vaporeon, and friends had on the tier, super boosting the most powerful Pokemon in Ubers, was as unstoppable a strategy as possible. As a result, Baton Pass was actually limited in Gen 3 Ubers too, as they may only run one Baton Pass Pokemon per team. In Generation 4, Honest Baton Pass was rare. U-Turn was preferred as a pivoting tool, while stat passing was largely unnecessary given the immense power creep flying around. Who needs to pass boost to Salamence when Mence was so monstrously powerful to begin with? The one exception was Jolteon, most commonly on its ferocious choice spec set. Its sparse special attacking move pull meant it could easily slot the move in there, and it used it to great effect. In addition to the U-Turn style pivoting to rack up hazard damage on something like Blissey, Baton Pass also avoided pursuit, so Jolteon could use it to safely escape Tyranitar. Some players even like Subpass Jolteon with Wish, which was a thoroughly unique Pokemon for its blend of offensive and defensive utility and team support. There were other instances of Honest Baton Pass, though very rare. Usually it came in the form of Celebi after it had received Nasty Plot and Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Its favorite recipient was Agility and Polion, which was already naturally strong, but became downright terrifying when receiving special attack boosts. When Baton Pass was used in Generation 4, it was usually of the cheap variety. The most horrifying variant of which was the rock polished Source Dance Gliscor. Its huge natural bulk, coupled with Yachi Berry to withstand even ice moves, and of course Taunt to shut down phasing attempts, made it incredibly efficient at passing both speed and attack boosts, especially since it was supported further by light clay extended dual screens that let it survive even explosions. Gliscor would send its boost to a Lumberry Metagross with four attacks, and that was perhaps the most instant game ender in the tier. Gliscor passed one of the most loathed, reviled, despised, abhorred players styles in the tier. For a long time, nothing would get you more ridiculed than using this strategy. It was hardly even a dice roll either. A huge part of the problem, as has been true of problematic forms of BP throughout the ages, was that it was too reliable. And as players explored it more, they optimized it to ridiculous levels. Eventually, Gliscor Pass even featured Gligar alongside it as a second way of passing attack and speed boost to another sweeper, should the first try fail. There was no method of quote-unquote outplaying the strategy. Everyone 
everyone who realized they were facing it exhausted every possible option before realizing they were going to be bulldozed with nothing they could do about it. To make matters worse, the screen setter on Gleiskor Pass team was Azo, which didn't exactly give away what style of team you were facing, even after it used screen. Full chains were also ridiculous and saw a great deal of tournament success, to the chagrin of many. For a long time, the discourse around them was muddled and confusing. It felt so wrong to ban or limit Baton Pass, which was the so-called outside playstyle that only existed to disrupt the stability of common teams, and players would regularly cite examples where the strategy didn't work, completely missing the point of how bad Baton Pass was for the game, how it forced matchup reliance instead of player interaction. There was even controversy over what competitive Pokemon quote-unquote should be. Generally, it was agreed that emphasizing the competitive aspects of a game played competitively was most important, though this still came as a shock to a significant portion of the player base. As full chains were optimized over time, they too began to take a more prominent, oppressive place in the meta. Players were furious as they were regularly unable to stop chains featuring low-tier Pokemon like Electrode and Hypno from super boosting repeatedly until Togekiss was ready to come in and win. It took an absurd amount of time and effort for Tyrion actions to be taken, but eventually a ban was enacted that successfully targeted both Gliscor Pass and Full Chains. Teams were limited to one Baton Pass user per team, and that Baton Passer couldn't pass both speed and another stat. Problem solved. All seemed well, and it was, until Ninjas reared its head again. Its effortless speed passing proved destructive against teams lacking phasers, which were many, and when passing speed to threats as destructive and game-ending as Source Sense Marowak and Belly Drum Polyrath, the true problem was clear. Some Pokemon weren't meant to have certain stats boosted. Baton Pass threw this balance out of whack, and as a result, Baton Pass was banned from Generation 4 OU in its entirety. Fun fact, imagine Gliscor Pass, but instead of Gliscor, it's Mew. Yeah, that happens in Diamond and Pro Ubers, and many players consider it a blight on an otherwise balanced metagame. This strategy is considered cheap, dishonorable, unfair, a whole host of negative adjectives, and that's because when Mewtwo sets up screens and Mew effortlessly boosts with either Nazi Plot or Source Dance before sending the boost off to Dialga or Groudon, well, good night. Baton Pass knows no borders. Its aim is to simply destroy all metagames it appears in. Generation 5 came around and full chains were terrifying again, and team preview did very little to help. It's not like you didn't instantly know you were facing Baton Pass most of the time in previous gens by the sight of a Ninjask lead. Also forget phasing because the new endgame sweeping recipient on such squads was Magic Bounce Espeon, whose super boosted store power performed astonishing feats like cleanly one hit KOing specially defensive Jirachi throughout the quadruple resist. Additionally, there was a new form of quick auto win pass around. Shell Smash, passed by Gorbis and a Hunt Tilt to threats like Needle King to obscene destructive effect. In most cases, Baton Pass was equated with these cheesy, game-ruining strategies. Just like in Generation 4, Power Creep ensured you didn't have to pass boost for your offensive threats to become dangerous. The likes of Terrakion and Latios were instant KO machines already. However, there was one common form of honest BP around, and it wasn't even to pass any boost. Specially defensive Celebi was a metagame staple to withstand a million different things, mainly Rain. Its initial set used Parasong to stifle Calm Mind Reuniquist, and it used U-Turn alongside the move. The strategy was that Parasong would force the opponent to switch, and U-Turn would scout that switch effectively. Eventually, with Reuniquist falling out of favor, Celebi stopped needing to run Parasong and began running Baton Pass as its switch move instead. It couldn't do this before, as otherwise it Baton Pass its own Parasong count to its teammate switching in. However, now it can run Baton Pass to safely escape Choice Band Tyranitar's devastating pursuit, which was critical given how many teams relied on Choice Band Tyranitar to remove Celebi for the benefit of offensive Pokemon like Keldeo, Landorus Incarnate, and Breloom. Eventually, Rain teams using Celebi realized that if it was going to be using Baton Pass anyway, they may as well see if it could pass boost. And indeed, Nasty Plot Celebi passing to Agility, Thunder Hysterion, or Scarf Keldeo was devastating. It completely turned the tables on teams that expected Celebi to be a passive blob and thus tried to take advantage of it with Ferrothorn or Fortress. If that happened, Celebi would boost, pass, and the game was probably over. After this strategy became popular, Celebi was treated with a lot more respect when it appeared on Rain Team. There were other rare instances of honest BP, mostly Celebi, Gliscor, and even Mian Shao capitalizing on forced switches to set up and pass substitutes. Once or twice, there were even sightings of Sun Teams using an incredibly gimmicky yet potentially absurdly dangerous strategy. Swords Dance Saucebuck Baton passing its boost to Scarf Darmanitan, which was as hilarious as it was overkill. However, none of these strategies really occupied true places in the metagame, especially not 
the Sazbuck example, even the more consistent ones, the subpassers, were rare offbeat strategies. Once again, it took a lot of time and haggling to take any sort of action against the negative aspects of BP. Eventually, the ban of limiting teams to one baton pass user, which couldn't pass both speed and another stat, was enacted. In fact, it was implemented years before Diamond and Pearls was. We're just going in generational order. Anyway, Smash Pass was killed, full chains were killed, and baton pass existing in this new neuter form solved the problem for the move's toxicity for quite a bit, until players realized that this move still had many dangerous applications that remained legal. Mew became the baton passer of choice, as it would do absurd things like pass defense boost, to calm mine Reuniclus, to create the most unbreakable Pokemon ever, or pass multiple attack boosts to rock polish Metagross a la DPP. Enough was enough, and baton pass was nixed entirely. This was a huge blow to Celebi's place in the metagame, unfortunately, as a big part of what had made it so solid was how it could reliably escape Tyranitar. And finally, once again, Baton Pass featured to heavily negative effect in Ubers. Smash Pass was the most famously controversial and reviled, as Smeargle spored, Shell Smash, and Baton Pass to instant game-ending effect with obscene efficiency. Most teams without a Lumberry Tyranitar were immensely vulnerable to Smeargle's antics. Full Chains and Smash Pass returned to their usual infuriating effect in Generation 6. They took over tournaments, they dominated the latter, and generally caused immense ire in the player base. It was suspected quite early in the generation, multiple times. The first time, it limited the player base to three Baton Pass users. However, Scolopede, Smeargle, and Espeon teamed up to continuously cause havoc. This caused another nerf, limiting teams to just one Baton Passer per team. And all this before even Oraz released. However, However, BP was just getting started. With support from Dual Screen's Azelf, as well as Priority Tailwind, and Memental support from Whimsicott, Smeargle had an incredibly easy time setting up Geomancy and passing to Espeon. It was so worth going all in on Smeargle getting the pass off that teams didn't just run Whimsicott, but Cottony as well, just to give Smeargle a chance at successfully passing a second time should its first attempt not end in a sweep. This style, in conjunction with classic Smash Pass antics from Gorbis, meant that auto win pass strategies were as present and difficult to stop as ever. One couldn't even try to stifle them with Unaware. Espeon's boosted stored power was still too powerful for Unaware Quagsar or Clefable to withstand, while Kirin Black's Terravolt ignored Unaware entirely. These strategies weren't too common, as part of their strength was catching opponents off guard, but when they did show up, the results were destructive. There were even instances of Scolopede passing Iron Defense and Speed to Combine Espeon, being enough to end games. It was this last case in particular that spurred action from the player base. The restriction of one one baton pass user per team, and the BP are not being able to pass both speed and another stat was enacted. Incidentally, it was applied to both Oraz and Black and White at the same time. Anyway, Smash Pass, Geo Pass, and Iron Defense Speed Pass were all removed from the game, and all seemed well, until teams using Speed Pass Scolipede began to appear. As it turned out, passing multiple speed boosts to Pokemon like Tail Glow Manaphy and Source Stats Mega Heracross was incredibly unfair. Again, there is a reason some Pokemon do not not have the capacity to boost certain stats, and Baton Pass broke this. As a result of the speed passing Scolopede antics, Baton Pass was banned from Oraz as a whole. Finally, in Generation 7, it didn't take forever for action to be taken against Baton Pass. It was so clearly ridiculous that the move itself was banned very early on. Why, you ask? Well, it probably would have happened anyway, given all the player base knew about the absurdity of Geo Pass, but the process was significantly expedited because Necrozma and Magirna were the most unstoppable recipients in Mad so monstrously obscene that even ardent Baton Pass defenders had a difficult time arguing that they weren't unfair. And as a result, Generation 7 was a pleasantly Baton Pass free generation. Generation 7 may have gotten rid of Baton Pass early on, but Generation 8 one-upped it in this regard. The player base had been through the Baton Pass song and dance too many times by now and preemptively canned the move, deciding to not waste time on something that would very obviously be broken if it was allowed. And that brings us to our conclusion. In single Goals, Baton Pass, at least in its entirety, is so unfair, almost inherently so, that letting it run loose in OU is almost akin to allowing Rayquaza. It's so obviously broken, and you know that you're going to wind up banning it, so you don't even bother. For this reason, Baton Pass is not coming back to singles. Maybe there's room for a complex ban of sorts to allow things like dry passing or sub passing, as one couldn't argue that those are broken, but then you open up a can of worms about the merits and or slippery slopes of complex bans, and that 
that's a subject for a different video. What we do know, however, is that when left to run loose, Laton Pass has thrown metagames into chaos again and again and again. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. Again, in the comments, I want to know what other types of new videos do you want to see? Whatever it is, let us know in the comments. Also, thank you to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.